I'm Dare Bullock, beef specialist at the University of Kentucky. And I'm Brenda Paul, Bourbon County beef producer, member of the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, and the producer representative for beef at the Kentucky Livestock Care Standards Commission. Welcome to the Beef Cattle Handling and Care Certification Program. This program is a result of the Beef Leadership Conference held in 2012 where a hundred beef producers from across the state met and identified five key areas of beef production they felt needed to be addressed. One of the areas of importance was the need to ensure the proper care of cattle. Now as beef producers we realize the importance of taking care of our cattle. It improves the overall productivity of our herds and I think we agree it's just the right thing to do. By participating in this educational program and completing the certification process, you are showing a true commitment to your cattle and to the beef industry. This program was developed by the University of Kentucky Beef IRM team, the Kentucky Beef Network staff, and Dr. Phil Prater at, at Moorhead State University. This program consists of the video you're watching now, plus written materials developed by the IRM team and some materials produced by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. You will also receive a shoot side aid that will help you during the processing of cattle. In this video, we're going to be discussing the genetic influences on handling and care, proper handling techniques, proper nutrition, best management practices on things such as calving problems, castration, dehorning, and vaccination, we're also going to discuss uh, some disorders, both eye disorders and lameness, and management weather extremes. And then we're going to close out by discussing the proper humane euthanasia techniques. Upon completing this course and getting a satisfactory grade on your assessment exam, you will be recognized as certified in beef cattle handling and care. Thank you again for doing your part to help the beef industry. It is an important step in making our industry the best that it can be. There are a few aspects of animal handling and care that we can control or modify through our bull selection decisions. In regard to handling, this always works best when we have calm cattle to work with and the disposition of cattle is determined by their genetics and how we treat them. When evaluating bulls, it is always important to work with the bull to see what his disposition is like. This is important so that we don't bring an animal onto our farm that will cause harm to humans or damage our property. However, by evaluating the disposition of the bull, it is difficult to know how his calves will behave when they are born. To determine the genetics for behavior that your bull will pass on to his calves, we need to look at his docility expected progeny difference, or EPD. Higher docility EPDs means the bull's calves should have the genetic potential for calmer behavior. It is still important to treat your cattle in a calm manner, and when you combine this with good genetics for docility, you shouldn't have any disposition problems out of your cattle. When considering the proper care of cattle, one potential problem that can be managed through genetic selection is calving difficulty or dystocia. When selecting a bull, it is important to make sure that he has the proper genetics for calving ease, and this is accomplished once again by using EPDs for calving ease. There are actually two calving ease EPDs. One is called direct and is an indication of the calving ease of the bull that you're buying, and the other is calving ease maternal, and this value indicates the potential calving ease of the bull's daughters when they will calve as heifers. When selecting a bull to breed to heifers, select a bull with appropriate values for calving ease direct. When selecting a bull that you plan to retain his daughters as replacement heifers, ensure that he has good values for calving ease maternal. Unfortunately, the breed's EPD values are different, and there's not one set of values that we can give you to select upon. There are also other factors that come into play, such as how many heifers versus cows will be bred, how much time will be spent with the cattle during calving season, and other factors. If you have difficulty determining what value is best for you, consult your Ag and Natural Resources agent or consult our online publications dealing with bull selection. 
Another way to reduce calving problems in heifers is to take pelvic measurements on heifers and call the ones that have inadequate pelvic openings to deliver a normal sized calf. It is important to use pelvic measurements to call the ones with inadequate size, but do not select heifers based on large pelvic openings. This trait is closely correlated with frame size, so this would lead to increasing the mature size of your cow herd and result in higher input costs. Also, taking pelvic measurements does not reduce the need to select for calving ease bulls as previously discussed. For more information and guidelines on pelvic measurements, see fact sheet ASC 142. The last area of cattle care that can be managed through selection is to genetically eliminate horns, doing away with the necessity to dehorn. The simplest way to eliminate horns through selection is to buy a bull that is homozygous for the pole allele. This can be done by using a bull from a breed that is naturally polled or by using a bull from a breed that has both the horn and pole condition but has been genetically tested to be homozygous polled. A homozygous polled bull will always have polled calves, even in the extreme case of breeding him to a group of horned cows. However, a polled bull can be a carrier of the horn allele and produced horn calves. That is why it is necessary to test and determine whether he is homozygous polled or a carrier. Be cautious of bulls that are listed in a sale catalog that states double poll. This simply means that both the bull's parents were polled, but he could still be a carrier. Also, when using a homozygous bull, it is still possible to get scurred calves. It is relatively easy to eliminate horns from your herd, but almost impossible to completely eliminate the possibility of scurs, and there is not a genetic test for scurs at this time. By using these simple selection practices, you can make your life easier and take care of your cattle's well-being all at the same time. With the cattle handling, the main thing is, is to get the animal where they're not afraid of you, but will respond to you. And there's a real difference there. Fear, they just run off and they're, they're not thinking about where they're going. But if they're responding to your pressure, they move where you want them to go and how fast you want them to go. Cattle, if they can see you and you let them respond through vision rather than noise or hitting them, then they'll start working for you off pressure. The next thing is, is you know, cattle are gonna try to go to other cattle or they wanna be with other cattle. So you can use that to your advantage or disadvantage. And then the last thing would be, they like to kinda go where they're headed. They wanna be straight and going in a line. If you can use those things and then add in the balance point, which is the point where the animal will stop and turn away or come on by you, the farther forward the balance point is, the easier the animal is to work from the front end where you have the most control. The flight zone, or what I would rather call as a pressure zone, that's the, uh, the area where the animal starts to move away from you or respond to you. And the more precise and the more control we have on the pressure zone, the better our animals work for us. First thing to remember about sorting cattle is to move easily and slowly and methodically and then take advantage of two principles that we teach in animal behavior. One is their flight zone. An animal has some distance that they're not comfortable when you invade their space and they'll tend to move away from you. The other is a point of balance, which is somewhere around their shoulder to their eyes, when if, you, if you're in front of that, they may stop or move back. Uh, but if you're behind it, then they'll move forward. So if we, want to, we want to take advantage of those principles and sort cattle off. And we can do that, try an example here. Let's say we've got one black white faced cow in there and we want to hold her but we're going to sort the three black cows off. Then we, we move from side to side, kind of get into their space and, and then take advantage, let them move away from us. Okay, we'll take it, take what, kind of what we get offered here. Here's one coming around. We can get behind her. Now stop these cows right here. Okay, we're going to stop those. We're going to let this one go. We're behind her point of balance. We're going to stop this cow here. All right, now the next one we'll take off is the other black one, get behind her point of balance and bring her up. And then we hold, we hold the black white face cow. See, she's, we move those other ones away. Now we can put them through the chute or do anything we want to or take this cow back. And by a point of balance, let me show you, we can, we can make her stop or we can move her forward a little. We can stop her. 
we can move her forward, we can stop her. And this, the paddles, these are not to beat cattle with, these are just an extension of, of our arms so that we can stand back and not get kicked. The closer you can find an animal, the more likely you are to get kicked, so you don't want to hurt the animal, and you obviously don't want to hurt yourself. So anytime you're sorting cattle, just remember move slowly, easily, methodically, and you don't need too much help. You don't need too many people in the way. And what the animal really wants is to get back where they came from. What you're really doing is not stressing the animal so much as uh, the relocation effect is what they really don't like. We see this in cow-calf operations, stocker operations, feedlots, every aspect of it. They tend to drive cattle from behind. And I don't know, if you notice in working the corrals today, I'd always try to push the cattle away from the gate that I wanted them to go to, to where when I get pressure on them and they could take the pressure off by going to the next corral. So I'd always push them away from where I want them to go and then release them. And it doesn't take much to do that. You just kind of step back a half step. But that teaches them, once again, that you're going to take the pressure off of them and let them go to where it's less stressful. One thing that's really important is handling small groups. They've been bringing up small groups of cattle. Also notice that this crowd gate's just put here on the first notch. Normally with crowd gates, I just put them on the first notch. I don't push it all the way around the pen. Crowd gate, that's your emergency brake. That you only use that, you only need that animal starts to turn back. Another thing is the crowd pen is a passing through pen. Don't fill this up and make the cattle wait. What you want to do is wait until your chute is almost empty inside and then you bring them up and they go right on around and right up the chute. Another reason why this tub works really well is it's taking advantage of the cattle's natural tendency to go back to where they came from. You're bringing them in and going around a full half circle. A lot of the smaller tubs work really poorly because they just go straight through. And there's other kinds of systems too that can take advantage of the cattle's natural tendency to come on back. The same thing happens in a bud box system or a return alley system. You put them in there and they turn and they come on back because cattle want to go back to where they came from. Another common mistake that's made in laying out curved systems is where your chute joins your crowd pen, they're bending it too sharply. If you bend it too sharply, it's not going to work. If this flag end is the cow's uh, eyes, she needs to be able to see up there two body lengths before it turns. Coming in nice and calm, see passing through pan, you bring them in and there's room in the chute. You know, don't put cattle in the crowd pen until you got room in the chute. That's really important. And that, that is important, all kinds of designs of crowd pens. You use the same principle at your loading ramp. Get your truck backed up, get all your gates ready, get everything ready, then you bring the cattle up through the crowd pen and right into the truck. Don't have them there stopping. Lighting is very critical in all types of cattle handling facilities. Cattle do not like to go from a bright sunny day like this into a building. One thing that's good here is your single file chute is, uh, is mostly outside. So you're getting them lined up in single file before they enter the dark building. I've seen a lot of facilities where you have what I call the black cave effect. And they're not going to go in because it's too dark. And in some buildings, what you're going to have to do is take some of the tin off so that they can see light. The absolute worst place to put a building is right where your single file joins your crowd pen. And that's true for all different kinds of systems. You just walk on back by them. Usually, just as you walk by the shoulder, the cow is going to go forward. And often, that's much more effective than just standing behind them and poke them in the butt. You walk back by them in the opposite direction of desired movement. Sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it really works. Just try it. But again, do not stand at the head of a cow and poke it on the butt. Then you're telling her to go forward and backward at the same time. You just want to walk on by her. One mistake that people make in a lot of facilities is putting in too many of these anti-backup gates. If cattle are backing up all the time, then you've either got a problem with uh, where people are standing or a problem with the design of the facility. Um, if you have a backup gate right here, that will lots of times make the cattle balk. And what you're going to want to do is hook that up with a remote control rope so that you can, you can stand back there and open up that backstop gate. And now I want to address solid sides. 
You know, there are some advocates of, a, of good cattle handling. They say we should take all solid sides off. The, I don't agree with that because the most important place to have solid sides is outer perimeters of facilities, especially in places like where there's a lot of cars going by, uh, many ranches. The truck loading ramp is right by the highway. Every time a car goes by, it spooks the cattle. You're definitely going to want to have a solid side so the cattle don't see cars going by on the highway. Um, if you've got a lot of inexperienced people working cattle, I'm going to want to cover up all the sides. If you've got really experienced people that will respect the animal's flight zone, then I would recommend you know solid sides on the perimeter, and you can have it open on the inner radius. But people have got to respect the flight zone, because if you've got animals rearing up in the chute, they're rearing up in the chute because people are in their flight zone. And when they're rearing up, you need to back up. You need to back up and get out of their flight zone. Really important in handling facilities to have non-slip flooring. Animals panic when they start to slip. Got to give them a non-slip floor. You can uh, weld the uh, steel rods together, but you want to make sure that you weld the rods this way. Don't weld them like this. They'll break their hooves off. Uh, you know, grooved concrete, or you can get woven tire mats. But slippery flooring is really bad. Good cattle handling is impossible. Animals are constantly slipping and sliding all around. Also, there's a lot of different designs of things. There's a lot of different opinions on, on design and handling. But let's look at the thing where everybody can agree, outcomes. The outcome I want is calm animals walking through facilities. They're not bashing into gates. They're not trying to jump out of facilities. It's calm. If an animal bellows, right when you squeeze it in a squeeze chute, you're hurting it. If you've got cattle falling down when they come out of the squeeze chute, you've either got a slippery floor or they're getting totally crazy. Many times I have said, if you fix the back end, problems up in the squeeze chute will fix themselves. I want a calm animal coming up into that, um, into the squeeze chute. You know, good handling starts back here. We've got to keep things calm. Also, no yelling and screaming. Yelling and screaming is very stressful. Whistling is very stressful. I want to get people's mouths closed. What about the issue of hot shots and electric prodders? Get them out of your hand. You know, in most ranch situations, you can pretty well get rid of electric prods. The only place you might ever need one is a very stubborn animal that won't go in the squeeze chute. You pick it up, you use it, then you put it away. But get it out of your hand. Either use a flag or a paddle for your thing for your hand, and don't be doing this with it. You should just be doing like this with it. Got to calm down. The most important feature of any good cattle handling facility probably begins with a head gate. The head, there's different uh, head gates available, different styles, and one thing we have to consider, we're looking, we're looking at this one, this, this head gate uh, is, is straight, it closes right here. This is bad for uh, small calves, they can get, it's a choking hazard, calves can choke there. So we, we would rather, if we were working baby calves, for this be a stanchion head gate that closes from the side and then stops and, and does not choke the animal down here. The other feature that this has that you can add on to a lot of head gates and, and uh, uh, squeeze chutes is a breast bar. This breast bar keeps cows from going down or calves from going down. If you're doing some procedure on them, it keeps them from getting down where they might come as uh, nearly choking. So this, this keeps them standing up and keeps them from just going down in the chute. And it's a handy, handy thing that we can add on to any good squeeze chute. Okay, this is another example of a head gate, a more of a multi-purpose head gate that works for large animals like a bull or will catch a baby calf without, without any, any choking hazards because it goes all the way down. This is, this is uh, no wider down here than it is up here, which I think as we adjust it, it's referred to as a stanchion kind of head gate that we can catch it. Uh, and put the amount of pressure on it we want on it. And the one thing to remember, I think about catching an animal in a head gate, is don't let them run into it and hit it wide open because it, it closes on their shoulders. If you, if you have an animal coming in and it's running and, and the gate's open, just, just close it, let them stop when they get up there, then open it when they stick their head through and catch them. And that works well. We have to be sure, though, that we don't choke these animals down. And you can watch them when they're in there. If they've been in the chute very long, watch them if, if uh, they look like they're in distress or something. We may have to let them go. They can actually choke down.
So we want to avoid any choking hazards as possible. And this is just an example of a good multi-purpose uh, kind of head gate that most anyone could get. We start moving cattle toward processing area. How you do it impacts how they're going to flow through the whole system. Here the cattle are corralled. I always put pressure away from the gate I want them to go into if they've been held in that corral for very long. Push them to the back. That'll start the flow away from the pressure. And as you see, you start that flow, you can have that movement pull the whole group in without having to drive those cattle into that next uh, corral. Now here I put pressure on it from the side. I get in pretty deep putting a lot of pressure on so I have to back off to keep the front straight to where I can start my flow into that alleyway. Walk down their side, speed them up, bring them around that corner. Now here I'm just working back and forth across the alleyway. The only way I can put pressure on the front is to keep the back end of the cattle moving and, and keep that flow going down the alleyway. So you just want to put pressure on the cattle. You can see them kind of turn there, work from the side of the alleyway and then cross the alley as you need to to keep pressure on the cattle. As these cattle, once you get flow started going into the alleyway out of this little pen, they're going to balk because they come around that corner quite often. So you just got to keep enough pressure and we have movement behind the leaders that they're going to keep pushing into them and keep them coming around that corner. So once again, once they get in there, We'll work that alleyway from side to side and keep putting pressure on the back. You don't want to put too much pressure because they don't have a place to go. Now we're leading into the processing area. Never bring more cattle in that processing area than will fit in the lead up to your chute. This particular little return box uh, set up here next to this tub allows me to get movement started. The cattle go past the tub, circle back into it, and that allows me to put pressure on the front cattle as they come around and I don't have to be pressuring from the back and they'll flow into that system. Well, if you have your flow going in there, they're going to keep the forward motion of that whole group. So once you start processing on them or uh, whatever you're doing, you allow that flow to go through. Open that head gate and make a step toward them. It draws the next cattle in. So you want to make sure you establish flow in the back, loading them, then you can process them once you release them step back toward them and it'll get them to draw on out. One thing I like to do is to let these cattle flow through the system without catching them if I can, at least once a year. That way they'll know they can get through that system without me doing anything to them. It always helps from then on in processing the cattle. If you work in a tub from the outside, one thing you want to do is to go to the front of that tub and I'll pull this back gate up when I do that, it's going to turn the cattle back, which is fine. But then I can work from the front of the tub toward the back, just like you would outside, and establish flow. You might need to use a paddle or something else if your cattle aren't handling very well to put a little more pressure on them. But once you get the first one started, just that little swing motion keeps them going. The animals balk in the chute. The best thing to do is, is don't be back here hitting on them. They, they don't know if you're, behind, if you're behind them. They can't see behind them. So what they do is you kind of establish your presence here and walk by this cow and then as I go by her point of balance, she moves up. So if we let, if we let one out, she should move up. Yeah, let one out. So when you want them to flow, just move by them. Okay. Uh, and the point of balance is right about here. So when I go by her, her tendency is to move forward because she saw me, now she moves forward. So yeah, let him go. So out we go. We're going by this cow right here. I move up, and she goes. She goes by. No need. No need for a hot shot. I'm Andy Mills, Ag and Natural Resource Agent here in Meade County. Uh, what we have today is a demonstration farm where we are going to uh, uh, try to work through uh, handling facilities that we have put together. Uh, when we started with this farm, there was a bare, bare minimum as far as the handling facilities. And so we have uh, put together a homemade facilities, but very practical 
and very inexpensive. With this facility, cattle are brought in from the pasture into this holding pen. And then from this holding pen, some sorting can be done or half the cattle, uh, up to about 15 cows work good to be brought into this other smaller holding pen. In this pen, some more sorting can be done. Uh, there's a cutting gate over in this direction where cattle will be cut back out into a larger holding pen. Um, and to what group you have in here, if you're gonna work them all, then the, the handling facility process really starts right here. When cattle are in, are in this smaller holding pen, you take what number you want to work, usually three or four, bring them through this gate. From here, they're funneled into the actual working facility. All right, after the cattle, after your, your three or four head are brought into the working facility, shut this gate behind them. Here we have another pin that if you got four or five or, or more than you need in here or you want to cut a couple of these out, then we have a couple of sweep or cutting gates that we can bring around. And either you, you can go ahead and, and sweep them into the working alley or you can do some cutting here. But ultimately we're going to use this smaller gate to sweep them right into the, the working chute. And from there, we've got them where we want them. All right, what we've got, we've got about uh, nine or 10 cows with uh, four or five calves in here. And in a typical situation, especially this time of year, we're maybe going to wean or we're going we're to do something with the cows and something different with the calves. So right now, what I'm going to try to do is sort some cows from the calves. And it's, it's much easier in most cases to sort the cows away from the calves. We've got three cows, which it'll take, it takes four to fill up the alleyway and the chute, but we've got three that'll fill up the, the alleyway, so that's probably about right. Come on, girls. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. And there they go, right where we want them. All right, what we've got is an uh, automatic head gate. So if you're working cattle by yourself, which this is, is set up for a one-man operation, if you have your head gate set right, you can run cattle in. First one's automatically caught. You come from behind and come up here and do your work on your cattle. And once you're done with, with, with your cattle work, out they go. One of the best systems that's come along lately is what we call the bud box. The reason the bud box works so well is it works with all the principles of livestock behavior. You push cattle into a box and then they, they want to get out so they'll turn around and try to find a way out. And the way out just happens to be the lead up to the chute. And if the handler positions themselves properly, it makes it work real smooth and slick and the animals follow each other up. Now the main thing to remember is when you're taking cattle up in, out of the bud box into the, the lead up to the chute is always make sure the lead up is almost empty before you start cattle in from the bud box. The other thing we want to do, we want to get the cattle kind of snapping. We want them coming into the bud box fairly quickly, not, not ramming and jamming, but they want to be at a good clip. They'll do that, they'll come in, and they'll come out the same way. And that'll cause that momentum to go right up to your chute. The cattle need to have plenty of room to turn around. So many times people put too many cattle in the bud box, and they can't make that move to get turned around, and then everything gets slow and they get wedged in the corner. When we're bringing cattle from the box to the chute, it's real important we have too much activity up at the chute. And the person that's in charge of getting cattle to flow towards the chute if they can think about going right straight by the cattle, going right by their eye, and coming from the front to the back, 
it causes the cattle to want to go right by them. That, that decreases the use of sticks, short sticks, paddles, hot shots. When the cattle learn to flow by you, that's when they're really working for you. Sorting cows and calves is a little bit different than just working stalker cattle. Normally we want to get the calves away from the cows or work them separately, so what we usually do is work the cows away from the calves because cows tend to handle a little bit better and possibly know the routine, so they work a little easier. We'll bring some cows down and the calves and then we'll just sort them off and we'll catch them in some gates and we'll work those gates. When you're gathering cattle with an ATV of any type, um, you have to do it a little bit different than you would if you were horseback or on foot just because the turning radius of one is a little different. Here we're trying to get these cattle started. I'm probably going a little faster than I need to with these yearling heifers, but they've never been uh, gathered with a four-wheeler, so we're trying to get movement started in them. The main thing you want to try to do is to get that movement started. You notice I turn away from the cattle as I go behind them because if I turn toward them, I'm actually going to put too much pressure on them at the wrong spot. So I'll turn away from the cattle come back in just like you were doing if you were horseback or on foot, pass behind the cattle. Once I get movement started, I'll get out to the side. Here I'm going back down the side of the cattle to start movement. I'd gotten a little too far to the front and stopped my movement, so once I get it started, I'll circle back out away from the cattle and then go back down their side to speed that movement up and keep my flow going out the gate. And once they get started, I don't want to put any more pressure than I need to on them and just stay back off the back. I can come out to the side, I'm drawing on that heifer away from the trough and get her started out the gate. But an ATV is a little different than uh, doing it on foot or horseback just because the turning radius, the stopping ability, uh, you just ha you can't be quite as precise. Trying to look at cattle to see if they're healthy or feeling sick or whatever, the cattle have to trust you. This is where the predator prey thing comes in. If you look, if the cattle look at you as a predator, they're not going to show you the true, if they're sick or not feeling good, they're going to try to mask that or hide it. We see that a lot in the feed yards. If the cattle like to be around you, understand what you want from them, they'll, they'll show you if they've got a little bit of foot rot coming on or if they're a little pneumonia or not feeling good, they'll, they'll let those signs show you. But if they're afraid of you, you won't see it until they're so sick it's too late to doctor them. An animal that's, uh, that's sick and has a fever and has a long way to go to the corral, uh, you, you're going to want to take them real slow. Take, take your time. So that would go for an animal that's got respiratory disease or lameness or uh, something like that. Uh, for diseases like uh, pink eye or foot rot or those kinds of things, move them as slow as you have to and, and get them in and doctor them. For diseases like grass tetany or anaplasmosis, you better not plan on moving them. You better try to do the best you can right where they're at because the stress of trying to move them may kill them right there on the spot. You really got to think when you're working with cattle with pink eye. The reason you have to do that is if the animal is blind in one eye, you've got to work all from the other eye. You've got to work either voice, which doesn't work as well as, as vision. So if you, you've got to make sure that that calf sees you from, if he's got pink eye in the left eye, you work everything from the right side. And you can either draw the animal and turn him, or you can get out wide and turn the animal pushing him. But if you get behind him and he gets confused, he won't be able to see and he'll turn around. He'll turn exactly the opposite way you're trying to go so he can pick you up with that other eye. Handling pink eye cattle is very, very challenging, but when you see somebody that's really good at it, it really tells you that they know how to work livestock. When you're dealing with foot rod animals, you've got to slow down. An animal with foot rot or a sore foot, he can only go so fast, or she can only go so fast. And if we try to hurry them, they can't go, they start balking on us, they get angry on the fight, or they get confused and try to hide, or they just quit you altogether. A foot rot cow might only be able to walk two miles an hour. So we've got to really slow down, and every time we put pressure on that animal, we've got to let him have time to get that pressure taken off, or else they'll just start fighting us. When you're moving cattle on a cow-calf operation and you're just moving short distances, you can probably put them on a trailer a little tighter uh, than you would if you're making a long haul, but you certainly don't want to pack them in too tight. If a cow were to get down on a 20 mile trip, it's just as detrimental if she gets down on a, a longer trip. So you want to make sure they have plenty of room to stand up, keep their footing, 
the, the thing that I always caution people about is, is hot shotting cattle when they're putting them on a trailer of any kind, whether it be a truck or a stock trailer. That's a bad experience they're going to associate with getting on that trailer. And so often people, if they've got a hot shot in their hand, will just touch them just out of habit. So ideally you'll start that movement and flow like we were demonstrating here today, let the cattle walk on the trailer. And when you do that, it's their decision to get on there. It's not stressful and they'll stand there quietly. They just haul so much better. And so try not to use any driving aids, certainly excessively to load stock trailers. Uh, like I said, you can load them pretty tight, but uh, make sure that when you do that, particularly if you're hauling pairs, that you do not haul calves uh, separate from cows. I see people that load up a load of calves and haul them somewhere and then Start bring the cows later. Or side, really even hauling the cows separately uh, the and then let bring the calves later. The cows may not know that's where their calf is. So you have to be careful on hauling pairs to make sure that that cow and calf arrive at the same time. First step in transporting cattle is not necessarily loading the cattle but being sure that what you're hauling them in is safe and ready to go, safe for you, legal, and especially safe for the cattle. So we could do, we kind of do a walk through around the cattle before we ever put, or around the trailer before we ever put any cattle on the trailer. Check the tires, tires uh, can dry rot. A lot of farmers may not use their farm trailer but a couple of times a year. So if something happens, they put it up and forget about it, but be sure that the tires are ready to go. Be sure that all, any broken pieces are fixed. Any weld that needs to be done is done ahead of time because cattle can put a tremendous amount of pressure on, on a trailer. Don't forget about the flooring in the trailer. This can dry rot or if it's made with boards, a board can break and an animal could easily, uh, foot could go through a, a broken board and break a leg. And uh, those are the kind of accidents we want to avoid. Uh, if any of these, be sure that all your cross gates are secured. And But once you, once you've got everything ready, then you can begin to think about how you're going to configure the load. First of all, what's a what's legal load? Uh, look at the, uh, the gross vehicle weight rating or the cargo rating on these trailers and uh, get some indication of, first of all, what you can comfortably get on here. We're not trying to load as many cattle as we can because if we do, then, then let's say you put cows and calves together, the calf could get down and get trampled and we avoid that by, by separating the animals. That's what the cross gates are for. We generally put the heavier animals on the front of the trailer and say the lighter the calves on the back. Another thing we do is let's always avoid uh, putting bulls in here that haven't been together. The bulls that haven't been together tend to want to establish a social order or a pecking order and they'll start fighting on the trailer and tear everything out. So we try to avoid that. But once we, can, we, we look at, at thinking about the load, how much can we haul legally and safely? Then the gross vehicle weight rating, let's say the cargo rating on this trailer is about 10,000 pounds. And then the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has a guide, a, a sticker that we will furnish you that tells how many animals you can get on a certain so much square, uh, square footage on a trailer. That's normally based on somewhere between 10 and 18 square foot per animal. And then we know about what we can safely get on there. This trailer, the, the cargo rating here is about 10,000 pounds. And so that's what we try, that's not many cattle, but that's what we try not to overload that. For example, if we put in nine, uh, 1,400 pounds, we'd be, a, nine cows weigh 1,400 pounds, we'd be a little bit heavy. Water is an essential nutrient required by beef cattle. Water requirements will vary depending upon the animal size, environmental conditions, and production status. Younger, lighter cattle require less water than larger, mature animals. Water intake will be lower during colder, ambient temperatures than during periods when the temperatures are warm outside. Mature, lactating beef cows will also consume more water than cows that are not lactating as water is utilized in the milk production process. The diet can play a major factor in the amount of water consumed from a tank or other water source as well. Feeds with higher moisture content, such as silages and fresh forages, will often provide substantial amounts of water, while dry feeds, such as harvested hay and grains, are low in water content, causing cattle to consume more water. Ample, clean, fresh water should be made available at all times to beef cattle. Sources of water may be from municipalities, wells, ponds, streams, or developed springs. The quality of water can influence intake. Water should be clean, 
and contain low levels of dissolved solids. Water that is high in nitrates, sulfur, and or iron should be avoided if possible. Pond water should be clean and free of blue-green algae. Consider fencing cattle out of ponds and using a tank below the dam or developing a limited access area for the pond. When using livestock tanks, routinely clean them. Develop a schedule to clean, check the valves and floats, and the flow rate. Again, water is an essential nutrient for beef cattle and should always be accessible to the cattle. Though consumed in the lowest amount, minerals are essential for beef cattle. They are central to cellular energy metabolism, nerve signal transduction, bone development and strength, reproduction, immunity, and many other processes within the body. Minerals are consumed in the forages and feedstuffs provided to livestock, as well as those that may be in water sources. Mineral needs vary with the stage and rate of growth, stage of production, and breed type within cattle. Younger calves have greater calcium and phosphorus needs to ensure proper bone development. Beef cows with high milk production also require greater calcium than non-lactating cows. In general, our forage base is deficient in many of the minerals essential to support today's beef cattle production. Special conditions and imbalanced diets can give rise to disorders. Grass tetany, which is a magnesium deficiency, can be seen in beef cows that calve during early spring on lush pastures and to a lesser extent in the fall and winter. Winter tetany generally occurs when lactating cows are consuming forages from cereal grains such as wheat and rye or during periods of time when they may be grazing these forage sources. Providing a supplement with greater than 10% magnesium can greatly reduce the risk of grass tetany. Water belly or urinary calculi can also occur when the ratio of calcium and phosphorus is incorrect, leading to the formation of kidney stones, which can lodge in the animal's urethra, blocking urine flow. The soils in the region are generally deficient in essential trace minerals. Selenium, copper, and zinc are often below levels required by beef cattle. Providing a mineral supplement that contains moderate levels of these trace minerals can aid in eliminating these deficiencies. In special cases, excess intake of certain minerals leads to a reduction in the availability and or an interference in the absorption of minerals, which commonly is referred to as an antagonism. These situations may require a specially formulated mineral supplement to regain the level of production desired by the operation. As sodium is low in forages compared to the animal's needs, ruminants tend to crave salt. Salt can be used in mineral supplements to both aid in the promotion of intake and also limit the intake of certain mineral products. However, salt in the form of a block or loose should never be used as the sole mineral program for beef cattle operations. Providing a complete mineral product which balances the mineral needs will promote better intake of all needed minerals and support acceptable levels of beef production. Kentucky 31 tall fescue is a predominant forage species on many of our beef cattle operations in Kentucky. It's a very productive forage, has great persistency under grazing pressure, however does have some negative attributes. Kentucky 31 tall fescue has a fungus that lives within it that produces ergot alkaloids. These ergot alkaloids can have detrimental impacts on animal performance. These alkaloids cause vasoconstriction, which reduces blood flow to the extremities and can lead to loss of the tail switch, fescue foot, and in some situations also can lead to what we refer to as fat necrosis. These ergot alkaloids also have a negative impact on reproduction and fertility, reducing the overall performance of the beef cattle herd. Years of research have identified best management practices that have been shown to help reduce the impacts of the alkaloids on animal productivity. Because the alkaloid levels tend to be highest in the seed head, reducing the amount of seed head consumed by cattle 
will help reduce the impacts. Clipping pastures and removing seed heads is one management strategy identified to help reduce the impacts of fescue toxicosis. Diluting the forages with other species, such as interseeding with clovers, or moving to pastures seeded in forages other than fescue can help reduce the impacts of the fescue toxicosis on beef cattle production systems. Grazing warm season perennials or annuals during the summer months will help reduce the impacts of the fescue on animal productivity and performance. Supplementation can help reduce the impacts as well as using one of the novel in the fight fescues out today. These new varieties have a fungus that lives within them that provides the plant with persistency in the same performance, however does not produce the alkaloids that have detrimental impacts on animal productivity. Beef cattle are ruminant animals. The microbes within the rumen allow them to utilize a wide range of feedstuffs to meet their nutritional needs. The first key point is that a balanced diet will deliver nutrients at levels which meet the nutritional requirements of the animal. Beef cow-calf operations utilize forages as the foundation of the nutrition program. Forage quality varies over the course of the season and ensuring nutritional needs are met for beef cattle can be challenging. This said, it is not uncommon for beef cattle to have nutrient intakes below their requirements resulting in deficiencies. In situations in which energy and protein needs are high, as would be the case for cows at peak lactation, the available forage base alone may be insufficient to meet the nutritional needs leading to the mobilization of body tissue which would be observed as a loss of condition on cows. Today, there are many feedstuffs available to supplement forage-based diets that will aid in meeting the nutritional needs and maintaining cattle performance. In the upper southeast, tall fescue is the predominant forage on beef operations. Most of this tall fescue hosts a fungus which grows symbiotically with the plant, providing improved persistency for the plant. However, the fungus produces compounds that can be detrimental to livestock production. Increased body temperatures, suppressed immune systems, reduced fertility, and other disorders can be attributed to these compounds. Research has provided producers with options to aid in managing the forage and partially reduce these detrimental impacts. In addition, new tall fescue releases have been developed containing various strains of fungus that provides the persistence while not producing the detrimental compounds related to animal production. With the increased processing of grains, cattle producers have access to a variety of alternative co-product feeds. Distiller's grains, corn gluten feed, corn bran, soybean hulls, rice bran, and wheat middlings are just a few of the available co-product feeds. These feedstuffs can be used to supply additional energy and or protein to forage-based diets while introducing little to no starch. These feedstuffs are excellent in transitioning rations, creep feeds, and as supplement to grazing beef cows. They do need to be utilized properly and you should consult a nutritionist to develop a properly balanced supplement for your livestock. Feeding beef cattle is generally very easy. As the forage is the predominant ingredient in most cow-calf operations, familiarize yourself with the forages you have in your pastures and hay fields. Then, learn how to best manage these forages to provide a high-quality forage that is also high in availability. Test forages for nutritional quality and work with a nutritionist to develop a strategic supplement program. Last but not least, always monitor the performance of your livestock and make adjustments as needed to ensure cattle are in adequate body condition and performing to your expectations. Body condition scoring beef cattle is a basic management tool. It is a tool that can be utilized to assess the previous nutritional status of an animal and to some degree the current balance between nutrient need and supply. Body condition scoring predominantly provides information related to the energy and protein balance of an animal. For example, a beef cow's energy and protein needs are at their highest point during early lactation. 
If the forage consumed does not provide adequate energy and protein to support the level of milk production, the cow is in a negative energy balance and body stores will be mobilized, resulting in a loss of body condition. Conversely, if the energy intake exceeds the nutritional needs of the cow at any given stage of production, tissue accretion occurs, leading to an increase in body fat stores. The body condition of a cow at calving and breeding, along with her energy balance post-calving, is strongly related to her subsequent reproductive success rate. Using body condition as an indicator of nutritional status is preferred for beef cows over body weight change. This is due to the fact that during late gestation, fetal development will result in weight gain, which can offset weight loss from body stores that are mobilized. Thus, cows in late gestation, at maintenance, should actually be gaining weight as the fetus grows. Body condition scoring is a subjective assessment of the amount of muscle and fat reserves of an animal. Moderate changes in body condition are normal for beef cows. Reserves are mobilized during lactation and replenished after calves are weaned and milk production ceases. Body condition scores are ranked on a scale of 1 to 9. The lower the number, the lower the body condition and fat reserves of an animal. Higher numbers correspond to higher body fat stores. Cows that are thin at calving will generally lose additional body reserves as they move into early lactation. An ideal body condition score at breeding would be a 5, with body condition maintained from calving to breeding. Because cows often enter a negative energy balance and actually lose condition during this period, having cows slightly above a 5 at calving will allow cows to be in an ideal condition at breeding. Body condition of cows is not a situation in which more is better. Reproductive rates can actually suffer if cows are overconditioned as fertility can be reduced. The 1 to 9 scale is correlated closely to the empty body fat content of an animal. Higher body condition scores correspond to greater amounts of empty body fat. To put this in perspective, empty body fat targets for finishing cattle are around 28%. Feeding cows to have excessive condition is costly and lowers productivity. The amount of weight corresponding to one body condition score varies depending on the frame size and muscling, but a condition score is equivalent to approximately 75 pounds of body weight. Assessing body condition is best determined by combining a visual assessment and palpation of the animal. However, from a practical stance, most producers will only conduct a visual assessment. Beef cattle managers should learn how to apply both methods to improve their accuracy of scoring. Key time periods to assess and record individual condition scores include 90 days pre-calving, at calving, at breeding, and at weaning. These times correspond with important production phases and can aid in evaluating management in the future. When assessing the condition of an animal, there are several areas that we focus on. These areas include the ribs, the hooks and the pins of the hips, the tailhead, the shoulder blade, the vertebrae, and the brisket. For the purpose of this session, we will focus on cows that are either too thin, adequate and conditioned, or overconditioned. In thin cows, the skeletal features are very prominent. Note the sharpness of the shoulder blade and point of shoulder in these cows. Most of the ribs are prominent and the hooks and pin bones are very sharp. Tissue in the brisket and around the tail head and even the hind quarter has been mobilized. These cows are in unacceptable condition to optimize reproductive success. Marginally thin cows have mobilized tissue but still have some body reserves. For example, the last two ribs will be noticeable to the eye but the four ribs will be covered and not appear sharp. The hip bones will be visually noticeable but still have a rounded appearance. The shoulder blade will still be covered and not as clearly defined as thinner cows. The brisket and the tailhead areas will have little if any fat accumulation in them. Cows that are near the target condition scores for breeding have a sleek and fit appearance. The skeletal features will not be prominent and they will have a smooth appearance. All ribs will be covered and smooth. There will be slight fat accumulation around the tail head and in the brisket. Hindquarters should have a full appearance. 
Note the smooth, sleek appearance of these cows with the shoulders, the ribs, the hips, all being covered. These cows are examples of cows that are in ideal condition score. Excessively conditioned cows cost money, increases heat stress, and lowers fertility in cows. Excessively conditioned cows appear blocky. They have excessive fat accumulation in the brisket, their tail heads are buried in fat stores, and the pin bones are mounded with fat covering. These cows will often come to heat, but not settle, coming back into estrus the next cycle. Body condition of beef cows is not static and will change as they move through their production phases. Tissue will be mobilized to support lactation and should be replenished then following weaning. In an effort to optimize reproductive success, maintaining condition on cows so that they are near five at breeding is recommended. Cows which are marginally thin at calving enter into a negative energy balance during early lactation, forcing mobilization of tissue to support this nutritional need. These cows will have longer anestrous postpartum intervals, reduced fertility, and will be at a greater risk of being open at the end of a controlled breeding season. To ensure cows have the best opportunity to breed back, manage their condition to have them near the ideal condition scores at breeding. Probably the most important component of winter care of our, of our cow herd is our winter feeding program. Producers have to make sure that their winter feeding program is adequately uh, meeting the needs and nutritional needs of the, of the cow herd and it's at a level that will maintain body condition even in the event of extreme weather. When weather turns cold and extreme, cattle use more energy just to stay warm and therefore we'll have to increase the energy density of their feed to maintain body condition. Now a lot of times it's just not as simple as putting an extra roll or a few extra bales of hay out because most of the time our hay is not of a high enough energy density to meet the needs of our cow herd when we're in extreme weather conditions. So in extreme weather conditions we really need to increase the energy density and supplement with an energy dense feed such as the ingredients such as like soy hulls, corn gluten, distillers grains, and, uh, and maybe even use some corn. Uh, these are energy dense feeds. We can deliver a small amount of, of, of feeds of this nature, supplement the energy that's in our hay feeding program, and, uh, and help maintain tame body condition. Another thing we need to be mindful of in winter feeding is uh, when we get in extreme conditions, whether it's extremely wet, muddy conditions, or uh, heavy snow cover, is can we adequately deliver this feed or this supplement to the cow herd uh, under these uh, uh, less than ideal conditions. This is, uh, this is something you need to be mindful of and, and uh, develop or plan ahead of time, ahead of the winter. Uh, have all weather access to your feeding pad and uh, be able to deliver feed to the cow herd. One more thing that, that producers may want to consider, in our, especially in our spring calving programs, is uh, providing some extra bedding for our newborn calves and, and calves that are calving out in the field in less than ideal situations. Uh, a lot of times it's very effective to unroll some, some hay out on the field and, uh, and give something where these baby calves can, can lay on and get, and get a break between the, the wet cold ground uh, and, and their body surface. If we're in a calving pasture, we can draw the calves and cows away from the heavy muddy feeding areas, give them a place to lay down and get off of, that, off of the cold, cold wet ground. Extreme winter weather can have a negative effect on the well-being of our cow herd. One thing producers need to be mindful of during any time we have an extreme weather event is to, is to monitor the wind chill factor on a daily basis. A good rule of thumb is, uh, is whenever the wind chill factor dips below 20 degrees, our livestock or our, our cattle are, are probably in a, uh, in a more of an extreme livestock stress uh, situation. And one thing we can do to help alleviate the stress on our cow herd is to provide a, uh, ample wind breaks or access to wind breaks so the cattle can get out of the wind and, and uh, reduce this, this added stress, this cold stress. Now one thing producers can do from a, in a simple standpoint if they've got access to pastures that have uh, a rolling topography that has some slope and maybe some southeast facing slopes, uh, cattle can gather behind these slopes and get out of prevailing north north uh, westerly winds and that that helps a great deal access to wooded lots especially wood lots that have a 
a significant amount of cedar trees or cedar thickets it is also very helpful this time of the year. Uh, small small herds may you know you may can provide access to some uh, loafing sheds or barn lots that, where cattle can gather in the barn on the cold nights on uh, when the when the fronts are moving through. Now, if you don't have access to to, to uh, natural windbreaks or barn lots, uh, one thing you may can do is is plan ahead and maybe build some kind of an art, artificial uh, windbreak, like we have uh, here behind me. Uh, this is one on the UK Research Farm in Princeton. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple structure. It's, it's basically uh, 50 feet long in, in length and about 12 to 13 uh, feet in height. Uh, we put it up on a mound uh, where the cattle can gather out of the mud and, and get up on the, on the mound and, uh, and, and stand behind it from a, uh, from a wind and be protected from the wind. Uh, an added benefit of this structure is uh, in the summertime, uh, in the mid to late evening, it a actually serves as a, as a shade uh, source uh, when the sun is, is getting low in the, in, in the, uh, on the horizon there in late evening. So that, it can provide some shade in, in the late evening when it's still hot in the summertime. So uh, it's been a useful structure that we've, that we've just uh, put up uh, several years ago here on the UK Research Farm. Another challenge during the winter time is making sure that the cattle have access to water uh, during extremely cold temperatures. We've got right here an insulated drinker which they have become very popular over the years for providing winter water sources. Uh, one thing that producers need to keep be mindful of, these that are energy free, in other words, are not, do not have any electric heat uh, to them like what we have here or relying on a chimney, a, uh, a thermal chimney underneath the ground to provide the, to keep the water from freezing. Uh, and this only works in, in, if, you, if you have enough cattle using this and you've got water turnover when the, when the weather gets extremely cold. Uh, recently, this winter, we've had some temperatures at below zero and it challenged some of the effectiveness of these energy free drinkers. Uh, whenever this, we get into very extreme cold temperatures, Producers need to make sure and monitor these waters, make sure that, they, uh, that they're either being used enough or utilize the drain valves on them and turn, these, turn the water over in, in the drinkers uh, two, three times a day, maybe even in extreme conditions. Another thing that can help uh, keep these waters free for, with flowing water is proper setting of the ball. It'd be better if you set the ball, the water level, to where the ball has about an eighth of an inch, just a, just a little bit of room between the, the housing and, and the surface of the, of the floating ball there. What that does is it allows water to, when the cattle drink, to drain back into the reservoir and it also allows this ball to move and vibrate a little bit in, in windy conditions and it'll kind of help keep, keep, the, uh, keep the, the, the drinker free and, uh, and, and uh, have full access for the cattle uh, during, the, during the cold temperatures. Cattle grazing summer pastures should have access to shade. Shade can come in the form of natural shade such as trees and tree lines. Trees provide a great source of shade for cattle. The high canopy allows for the heat to escape away from the livestock while still getting them out of the sun. Natural shade is preferred. However, when using natural shade, it is important that we move cattle to prevent any damage to the trees and or surrounding areas. One important consideration when providing shade to livestock is to ensure that there's adequate space for the livestock to get into. One of the limitations when we think about shade, and especially in a shade structure like this, is ensuring we've got ample room for all the livestock to get in out of the sun. So make sure that you plan to have more shade than what you think you might need. Cattle that do not have access to shade during the summertime will often congregate around areas that they can find relief to heat stress. Cattle that do not have access to shade in pastures will tend to congregate around areas such as water tanks to seek relief from heat stress. So if we can try and provide shade to cattle that are out in, in the pastures during summer, It'll spread out more manure across the fields better. We get more even manure distribution and also keep our areas around our water tanks uh, in better shape and less mud around our water tanks.
Stosha is a term used in the cattle industry to describe a difficult birth or calving problems. Normally, dystocia is the result of either an abnormal presentation, a disproportionate size of the calf in relation to the size of the pelvic canal, or an undernourished, unhealthy cow. Proper management of dystocia begins with the isolation of cows that are expected to calve soon and moving them to a designated calving area. This calving area might be in a barn or it could be in a separate pasture that provides protection for the cows from the winter. Once the cows have calved and their calves are strong, move them to another pasture away from the other cows that are calving. It is important to understand the signs of calving and to monitor the herd as often as is practical. Learning the signs of calving and calving difficulty is important so that assistance or intervention can be provided to ensure the health of the cow and the calf. One of the first signs of calving is relaxation of the pelvic ligaments. Another sign of imminent calving is the vulva swells and enlarges and the udder swells and enlarges as it begins to prepare for lactation. Often these physical changes can begin as early as 30 days prior to calving and the pelvis, vulva and udder progressively swell and develop as calving approaches. Understanding the calving process and when to intervene begins with an understanding of the normal presentation or body positioning of a calf at parturition. In this picture, the tape surrounding the calf is symbolic of the uterine wall. In a normal delivery, the calf's head and both front feet are the first to exit the cow. The forehead is positioned up and the jaw down. Both front feet are extended in front of the head. Perhaps the best way to relate a normal delivery is to think of a diver hands first, head forward and up, feet back. The calf essentially dives out of the cow. Dystocia is the term that we use simply to describe difficult calving. Dystocia is not obvious immediately. Cows need to be observed at minimum every three hours to ensure that the birthing process is proceeding normally. Research has shown that 31% of calf death loss from birth to weaning is the result of a difficult birth. Management of the calving process is vital. To begin to understand how to assist a cow during calving, we must first understand the calving process. There are three stages of calving that have been identified. Stage 1 is where the cow first can be observed to have entered the calving process. This stage typically lasts two to six hours. Initially, most cows will seek to isolate themselves from the rest of the herd. They will get restless and will kick at her belly and wring their tail often. These are signs of contractions and contractions will occur every 15 minutes during this stage. Pictured here is a beef cow in the middle of stage two labor. Note that she is lying down her feet are out and she appears to be contracting hard to expel the fetus. The placental membranes can again be seen exiting the vulva. Also in this picture, the feet of the calf are visible. Cattlemen need to consider intervening if a cow has been in hard labor for two hours without making any progress. First calf heifers need to be assisted earlier. Assist first calf heifers if they have not progressed within one hour after the water bag has appeared out of the vulva. Research has clearly shown that early assistance in stage 2 labor increases pregnancy rate in the next breeding season. This slide shows another cow in stage 2 labor. This cow has gotten up but appears to be looking for another place to lie down to finish the calving process. The placental membranes in the feet are clearly visible. Again, intervene if the water sac or feet are visible for two hours and no progress has been made. 
intervene after only one hour if she's a first calf heifer. A successful pull begins with having the proper facilities to restrain the cow. A good facility must allow for the cow to go down during delivery. Many successful calving facilities include a head catch that will allow the producer to place a rope halter on the cow to tie her head safely. The head catch is then opened after the cow has been securely tied. Also, a good facility is one where at least one side of the chute can be opened to allow the cow to lie down. Locate your equipment, clean it, disinfect it, and then store it where you can easily find it when necessary. And finally, perhaps the most important, is to store the emergency contact information for your herd veterinarian in the contact list of your phone so that it can be easily and quickly accessed. Some of the common equipment used for pulling a calf is illustrated in this slide. Here you can see two OB chains and the handles for each, a head snare, a set of tongs, and a rope. Some difficult pulls require a calf jack. If you have a calf jack, make sure that you locate it and that it's functioning correctly before the calving season begins. The time has come for one of your cows to calve. Making the decision to intervene or to assist is critical to ensure the health of the cow and the health of the calf and to maintain the breeding potential of the cow in the next breeding season. Pull the calf if heifers have not progressed after one hour of stage two labor. Pull the calf in cows after two hours with no progress. A dam can actually be in labor for as long as 12 hours or slightly more before the calf dies so you do have a little bit of time. However, remember early assistance improves the ability of the cow to rebreed so in my opinion it's better to be safe than sorry. The first step in pulling a calf is to restrain the cow. After the cow is safely caught she needs to be cleaned and the problem assessed. It is very important to be clean. Scrub your hands, arms, and the vulva with soap and water. It's also important to wear OB or palpation gloves while you're trying to assist the cow. Use lots of lubrication. Some of the best lubrication types to use are Novalu, J-Lube, or any other water-soluble lubricant. Do not use soap as a lubricant. It will wash away the cow's natural lubrication and the pulling process will actually become more difficult. Once you've cleaned your hands, cleaned the cow, and gotten your OB or palpation sleeves on, assess the situation. Is the cervix dilated? Where is the calf? What do you feel? Do you feel the head and two feet? Are they front feet or back? Do you feel two feet and no head? Is it upside down? Is all you feel the tail? What do you feel? In addition to the calf, is it too tight to deliver? Is the head back? Does there appear to be a blockage just past the cervix, which is a sign of uterine torsion? Do you feel something else very weird? The key to determining forward or backward presentation lies in examining the direction of the joints. If the joints bend in the same direction, then the front legs are first. If the joints bend in opposite directions, then the rear legs are first. Once you've decided that you need to assist the cow, the OB chains will need to be placed. Place the chains above the fetlock with a half hitch at the pasterns. The half hitch is vital to prevent injury as it more evenly distributes the pressure applied to the legs. Ideally the chain should come over the top of the fetlock and not the sides or the bottom. Once the chains are placed, hook the chains with the handles and begin putting pressure on the calf. Pull downward if the cow is standing or towards her feet if she is lying down. Try not to pull straight back. Put pressure on one leg at a time 
and alternate pressures between legs if possible. The alternating pressure on the legs helps move the calf through the pelvic canal. Rotate the calf about 45 degrees when pulling so that the calf is passing through the birth canal at the maximum diameter and you can prevent hip lock. This slide demonstrates the proper position of the calf. The 45 degree rotation enables the hips to pass through the pelvic opening at its widest juncture. Perhaps the most important decision of a cattleman during the calving process is when to call for help. Call for professional help when you don't know what the problem is. You've examined the cow, you can't figure out what's going on, call your veterinarian. Also, if you've assessed the problem and you know what the problem is and you even know how to fix the problem but you just don't think you can do it, call your veterinarian. And then finally, you've been trying to correct the problem for at least 30 minutes. So the, maybe the calf's head is back, you've pushed hard against the body to get the calf pushed to get the head forward or you've even got the snare around the lower jaw and you just can't get the head to come forward. If you've been struggling with this problem for 30 minutes and you've made no progress, call your veterinarian. There's little doubt that early assistance during dystocia improves pregnancy rate in beef cows. Cows should receive assistance after two hours in stage two labor and no progress has been made. Heifers should receive assistance after only one hour of stage two labor and no progress. As in most things in life, preparation and planning are the keys to assure success Castration of male calves should be a routine management practice for all commercial cattlemen. Calves should be castrated as young as possible, preferably at three months of age or less. They will be easier to handle, bleed less, and heal faster with fewer problems. Castration can be done by surgical or non-surgical methods. Non-surgical techniques include elastrator bands, burdizo or banders such as easy castrator or calicrate bander. Surgical methods completely remove the testicles and are the method of choice. Complications can occur but are easy to avoid by following some simple procedures. Good sanitation must be used to prevent infection. The person performing the castration must remain as clean as possible. So have paper towels and clean water handy to wash your hands between animals or as needed. Surgical equipment should be cleaned and disinfected between uses. Before beginning, make sure the equipment is sterile. This can be done by boiling in water for 30 minutes. Between calves, place the instruments in a disinfectant solution. Change it every 15 calves to maintain the antibacterial activity. A chlorhexidine solution such as Nolvacin is a recommended disinfectant used at the rate of 3 ounces in a gallon of clean water. A second principle to avoid complications is to adequately restrain the calf preventing undue excitement and allow the calf to be worked quickly and released. This can be done with a calf table or squeeze chute. When catching the animal in the chute, a second person should apply a tail restraint by grasping the tail near the base and pulling straight up over the animal's back. Do not twist to either side because it's really less effective and can result in a broken tail. Enough force is needed to immobilize but not hurt the animal. Thirdly, Palpate the scrotum to make sure both testicles are present before making the first cut. In some instances, testicles that have not descended into the scrotum can be located and worked down by hand. If the testicle cannot be moved into the scrotum, seek professional help by a veterinarian because the surgical procedure could be complex. Next, make incisions large enough to ensure proper drainage. Try to do castrations in cooler weather when flies are not a problem. Otherwise, apply an insect repellent to the scrotum. Make castration the last step in processing the calf. When the calves are released from the chute, they should be able to go to a clean, dry area. Now, let's look at specific methods of castration. There are several variations for surgically removing testicles. Speak with your veterinarian about which might be the best for you. In one technique, the lower end of the scrotum is grasped with either your hand or a pair of vice grips. Stretch the scrotum tightly and cut off the bottom one-third with a disposable scalpel or knife. 
The ends of both testicles should now be exposed and the spermatic cords visible. Frequently after this is done, the testicles will be drawn up high into the neck of the scrotum. To find the spermatic cords, one testicle can be held and pulled down while the scrotum is pushed up with the other hand. A second technique is referred to as milking. Both testicles are held and one is pushed forward while the other is pulled back. Reverse the process until some of the tissue holding the spermatic cords is broken down. Do not place your hands inside the scrotum. It can lead to infection. For cows weighing more than 300 pounds, the testicles should be removed using the emasculator. For calves weighing less than 300 pounds, the testicles should be removed by hand. Non-surgical or bloodless castration can be done several ways. One method uses elastrator bands. They are applied to the base of the scrotum above the testicles at as young an age as possible. The elastrator band is placed on the instrument and opened. Both testicles must be drawn down through the open band and held there while the band is released and closed on the base of the scrotum. This cuts off blood circulation to the testicles and scrotum. The tissue dies, dries up, and eventually drops off. There are several potential problems with this method. It is easy to leave a testicle in the body cavity or not place the band high enough so that male hormones are still being produced, resulting in decreased carcass value when finished. Tetanus may also occur. If the calf is banded at less than three weeks of age, the tetanus toxoid vaccine may not be necessary. Because of all these potential problems, this method is not recommended. Horns on cattle increase the possibility of injury or bruising. Horned cattle require more bunk space, are more difficult to restrain in a head catch, and are more likely to injure you in the process. Buyers prefer cattle without horns, or at the very least, those with horns tipped. Dehorning should be done as early in the calf's life as possible to reduce the amount of trauma and stress. There are several methods available. If dehorning is delayed until horns range up to four inches in length, an instrument known as a Barnes dehorner will be necessary. The instrument should fit over the horn to include a ring of skin and hair. Fit the blades around the base of the horn, spread the handles and twist while applying quick pressure. Good restraints necessary and local anesthesia should be used with this technique. If the horn is very large, the sinus cavity will be exposed and increase the possibility of complications such as bleeding, infection, and maggot infestation. You can control bleeding by using forceps to pull arteries or with hot irons to cauterize vessels, and then apply antiseptic spray and fly repellent. Injections are a common method of administration for antibiotics and vaccines. Give all injections in the neck and follow product label directions specifying the routes of administration. If there is an option of injecting subcutaneous or intramuscular, always choose subcutaneous to minimize pain and tissue damage which decreases product quality. When using the subcutaneous route, be sure and use the tenting technique to ensure proper placement. Pull the skin up and away from the neck and make sure the needle goes underneath the skin. For intramuscular injections, use the triangular muscle mass of the neck. Use only 16 or 18 gauge needles. For subcutaneous injections, the needle should be 5 eighths to 3 quarter inches long and 1 to 1 and a half inches long for intramuscular. Never place more than 10 milliliters of material in one injection site. If a greater total volume is necessary, separate the sites by at least five inches. Avoid giving any injections in sites that are wet or manure covered. There are many causes of lameness in cattle, but nearly 90% of lameness involves the foot, usually the rear feet and often the outside claw. A thorough examination of the foot is important because problems detected and treated early will usually not progress to a more serious condition. It is important to first assess the affected foot for swelling. This can be accomplished by comparing the distance between the dew claws. Notice the gap between the dew claws is increased in the right hind foot. 
indicating the presence of swelling. Next, look at the width of the heel bulbs on the affected foot. The heel bulb on the outside claw is wider than the inside claw, which suggests a problem deep within one side of the hoof. One possible cause is a sole ulcer, or hole in the sole of the claw. This may progress to a sole abscess, or pocket of infection within the foot that must be pared out and drained of pus. Immediate treatment with antibiotics is also needed. Foot rot is a common condition caused by trauma to the soft skin between the claws. The swelling seen in the foot is usually symmetrical and the claws are separated due to the swelling of the tissue between them. Later in the disease process, the swollen skin breaks open and a foul odor is present. Early treatment with appropriate antibiotic therapy will usually resolve this problem. Corkscrew claw or screw toe is a condition in which the outside claw of both hind legs is twisted spirally through its length. This is an inherited growth defect that often results in lameness due to sole ulcers and uneven weight distribution. Repeated radical trimming is necessary to maintain these animals in the herd. Since this trait may be passed on, it is best to call these cases. Hairy heel warts are lesions present between the claws just above the level of the heels on the back or the front side of the foot at the cleft between the claws. It is caused by a contagious bacterial infection in the skin and begins as a rough reddened depression in the skin of the foot, which progresses to a raised lesion with fine finger-like projections. Affected animals are acutely lame and very sensitive to touch. Treatment with an appropriate antibiotic sprayed on the area or medicated foot bath will resolve the problem. Cancer eye is the most common malignant tumor affecting cattle in North America and is the leading cause of whole carcass condemnation at slaughter. Exposure to solar UV radiation is considered a major contributor to its development. Hereford cattle are most susceptible due to the lack of pigmentation around the eyes. Common sites include the lower lid, the third eyelid, and the junction between the cornea and the white of the eye. The initial plaques appear as small raised white areas and progress to irregular nodular pink tumors. Without treatment, these cancers may spread to the regional lymph nodes and lungs. Diagnosis is usually made by clinical appearance. Your veterinarian is the most qualified to make those treatment decisions. In the cases of cancer eye for slaughtered cows, if the tumor has spread to the extent that it has destroyed the eye, the animal is condemned before slaughter. If the tumor is relatively small, the animal is tagged a suspect and is slaughtered. Then the public health veterinarian inspects it after slaughter. If there has been significant spread around the eye, which is only visible after removal of skin, or if there has been a spread to the lymph nodes of the head, the entire animal is condemned, head, carcass, and internal organs. If the tumor is localized to just the area of the eye, the head is condemned and the carcass and internal organs pass, assuming no other diseases or conditions are found. The pink eye is caused by the bacteria Morex elebovis. This bacteria is covered with hair-like structures it uses to attach to the cornea or clear portion of the eye. Once attached, it releases a toxin that kills cells on the surface of the cornea. Early detection and prompt effective treatment are essential to reducing spread and limiting damage to the eye. The earliest signs include a large amount of watery tears that often flow down the face, excessive blinking, squinting, and sensitivity to light. In one to two days, the cornea appears white and a small ulcer or pit develops towards the center of the eye. Some cases will resolve while others progress to deep ulceration and corneal rupture. Treatment with a long-acting antibiotic 
along with a topical fly repellent, is the best course of action to reduce the spread of pink eye in the herd. Active cases of pink eye with excessive tearing attract flies that spread the bacteria quickly. Work with your veterinarian to determine the best antibiotic for your situation. Isolation of the affected animals will also help limit the spread. A patch can be used to protect the eye, however, you cannot see if the eye is improving or deteriorating when covered. If the case of pink eye is very advanced, your veterinarian may suture the eyelids together or use a third eyelid flap to stabilize the cornea. Do not rely on spray since they remain in the eye just a few minutes before tears wash them away. To be effective, Application is generally required three to four times daily. Vaccination alone will not prevent disease. An overall good level of nutrition, adequate vitamin and trace mineral intake, a comprehensive vaccination program, and parasite control are all exceptionally important in improving the cow's ability to fight off any disease process. To reduce as many of the pink eye risk factors as possible, prevent corneal damage from sun by providing shade. Control face flies. Clip pastures to prevent mechanical injury from grass and plants and provide a clean water source in order to keep the eye clean and moist. Working closely with your veterinarian is important to establishing a good herd health program. Your veterinarian can assist you in both the prevention of and the treatment of many herd health issues. Establish a good working relationship with your vet to ensure proper cattle care. Euthanasia is the intentional causing of a painless and easy death to a patient suffering from an incurable or painful disease. Some reasons for euthanasia include a fractured leg that is not repairable, severe trauma, loss of production and quality of life, the inability to stand or walk, the possibility of carrying a disease that is a threat to humans such as rabies, an advanced case of cancer eye, or situations where the cost of treatment is prohibitive and the prognosis for a productive life is poor. To decide if a cow should be euthanized, consider the level of pain and distress of the animal, the likelihood of recovery, the ability to get to and ingest feed and water. This presentation will discuss gunshot or captive bolt and chemical methods. All methods require training and knowledge of anatomy to ensure proper humane euthanasia. Cattle must be restrained adequately for proper placement of a gunshot or captive bolt or administration of chemical euthanasia. Euthanasia methods need to be rapid with little to no stress to the animal. Some methods of euthanasia may be more practical in certain situations. Chemical methods of euthanasia require a federal DEA license and are limited to veterinarians. Another consideration type of euthanasia method is whether the tissue of the euthanized animal will be useful after the procedure. Some methods will disrupt tissues that may be needed for later observation, such as gunshot and penetrating captive bolt, which will disrupt brain tissue and make it difficult for diagnosis of diseases like rabies or mad cow disease. Using a gunshot to euthanize cattle is practical and inexpensive but comes with many obvious safety risks. Before using a firearm to euthanize cattle, check surroundings to ensure no one will be harmed in the event of a ricochet. Firearms should be held 2 to 10 inches from the intended point of impact. The gun should never be held directly against the head due to potential backfire from the gun. To lessen the risk of ricochet, the bullet should penetrate perpendicular to the forehead. The gunshot method of euthanasia should be accomplished with at least a caliber of a 9mm. 9mm bullets should be used due to the thickness of the forehead plate and frontal sinuses. 
Proper location of the gunshot of the animal's head is essential to ensure accurate euthanasia with a gunshot or captive bolt gun. To determine the most appropriate spot, draw an imaginary X from the top of the left ear to the inside corner of the right eye, and then another line from the top of the right ear to the inside corner of the left eye. The intersection of those two lines is the point of placement for the gun or captive bolt. You must also assure that the barrel of the gun is perpendicular to the forehead. Once the animal is restrained, pull the trigger and then the animal will collapse. Touch both eyeballs to see if there is a blink response. An improperly stunned animal will blink and react to pain. If this is the case, then repeating the above procedure may be necessary. Chemical methods for euthanasia generally include an IV injection of a barbiturate like penobarbital. These are anesthetic agents which are given in a concentrated overdose so the animal does not wake up from their unconscious state. Remember, those chemical compounds can leave residues in the muscle so people and carnivorous animals should not eat the carcass. This method of euthanasia provides the safest, most rapid, and most humane way to end life. As we come to a close in this program, there is one last topic that needs to be addressed. By your participation in this program, you are showing your commitment to managing your cattle in a responsible way. Unfortunately, as in most things, not everyone shares that level of commitment. So it's important that we as producers lead by example and take every opportunity to promote the need and the ways to properly care for our cattle. This concludes the educational portion of this program and hopefully you have learned something in this program even if it's just reinforcing things that you are already doing properly. Good luck on your exam that you will be taking now to complete the certification process. And if you have any questions in the future, please contact your local agriculture and natural resources agent. As custodians of our cattle, we bear a significant responsibility for their care and well-being. And the best part, when we do things right, the cattle are more productive and we work in a safer environment. It's a win-win situation. Thank you again for participating in this program.